Greetings, folks. Another episode of New Maroon Getaway, Life Examined by an Aspiring 21st Century Maroon. Um, we, we've got, um, we're going to continue reading through the uh, piece, the Richard Heinberg piece, uh, Human Predators, Human Prey. This is uh, going to be part two. And in this, uh, in this segment, in this part of the essay, he begins to get more into examining the, uh, the, the actual human elements within this uh, analogy of uh, society as ecosystem. So um, there's actually, there's a lot in this, um, there's a lot in this portion which I'm probably going to have uh, separate episodes to further sort of break down or examine some of what's discussed in this uh, in this part, but uh, I think this one is um, this is going to be I think particularly uh, interesting to uh, most of you uh, listening. So just to just to get started, and again, I'll I'll stop in certain portions to um, you know to mention a few points, and I'll, there there's there's some other references um, to uh, to some supplementary material uh, books that really get into uh, the the particulars, the specifics of some of what's mentioned here, um, really breaks down in detail and explains very well some of what he's referring to, um, with uh, maybe exam examples that uh, bring to light um, or bring to life, uh, you know, again some of what he's referring to here. So uh, this is section four, our current context, the adaptive cycle, conservation, and release. As we've seen, predator-prey relationships shape the flow of energy through ecosystems. But what happens in either a natural ecosystem or a human social ecosystem, quote-unquote, when energy flows increase? As long as sufficient basic nutrients are available and other conditions, such as climate, are, are stable, the system tends to grow in size in terms of biomass and or complexity. And that is exactly what has happened within the human ecosystem, quote unquote, especially during the past century or so. We humans learn to use exosomatic energy. That is energy apart from what is released from food through metabolism. When we started using fire several hundred, uh, several hundred years ago, I'm sorry, several hundred thousand years ago, the domestication of draft animals, particularly horses, oxen, and mules, and the harnessing of water power and wind power, at first with sails and then later with windmills, this increased our access to exosomatic energy. So again, the, the discussion of energy or really appreciating what it is that energy is and then how energy is represented or facilitated by a number of different means, which would also include financial means. This is central to everything that we're talking about, because basically what we're trying to figure out is how do you get access to energy? Um, what we're discussing is how, how we get access to energy. How do we get access to work capacity? Because it's by means of having access to work capacity that uh, in, the, in, the, in the societal sense, um, this is how we're able to secure or gain access to products and services that uh, allows us to, ha to, to live a life, to facilitate our lives, um, and ultimately to, to build wealth. More recently, technological developments, including metallurgy and the invention of the steam engine, opened the way to our use of fossil fuels, such as coal, oil, and natural gas, and this is a very uh, important point, is, is how technology has facilitated our ability to be able to do more work, right? So um, being that human beings have large brains, uh, giving us the ability to, to uh, develop tools, which allows for us to be able to amplify our ability to do work, um, this, is, uh, this has really been... Uh, you know, functionally speaking, a major, major uh, development. Very, very important. Fossil fuels representing tens of millions of years worth of chemically stored sunlight, or fossilized sunlight, enabled our global per capita use of energy to grow by more than 800%. 
in the past 150 years. With the confluence of science, technology, and fossil energy, many things became possible that were barely dreamt of previously, including aviation, global electronic communications, the mass production of goods, and a way of life, for some at least, characterized by lavish consumption. Humans, uh, human population grew from under a billion two centuries ago to seven and a half billion today. Cities and nations exploded in size, trade soared in volume, speed, and distance, and the destructive power of weaponry became global in scope. And I think the, the degree to which the way that we're living now, as opposed to what has marked the vast majority of human history, this is something that it, 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 it's very hard for us to appreciate this. Um, and this is why um, probably one of the most dangerous things for, you know, for us collectively is to have the kind of um, historical, um, either historical myopia um, or, uh, or historical ignorance, um, which uh, causes us to, to really not correctly read or be able to read what it is that's happening and reference that against, again, what, what it is that has happened uh, in the past. So, um, you know, this is, this is sort of the, the collective blind spot that uh, unfortunately is likely to come back and bite us in the tail, so to speak. The environmental impacts of human, act, uh, of human activities also skyrocketed. The rate of extinctions of species, mostly due to habitat destruction, rose to 1,000 times the normal rate. Glaciers began melting due to a warming atmosphere, itself due to the buildup of greenhouse gases from the burning of fossil fuels, raising sea, uh, raising sea levels. Topsoil began disappearing at higher rates, currently at a rate of over 25 billion tons per year. I've also seen this, that rate um, estimated at, at about three times uh, that amount, but 24 to 25 billion tons per year is, is what... Um, you'll often see cited in a lot of the authoritative data. Now, the reason why that's significant is um, civilizations are built on, on soil. They're built on um, the productive capacity of landscape. And the productive capacity of landscape, the functional capacity of landscape, is really predicated on whether or not you actually have soil that is um, fertile, is capable of holding water, transferring nutrients, you know, growing vegetation, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Dead zones appeared in oceans around the mouths of rivers due to fertilizer runoff. Um, fertilizer, of which is in currently uh, in the in in our industrial world, is all based off of uh, fossil fuels, so petroleum and natural gas. Huge gyres composed of bits of discarded plastic made from fossil fuels. Again appeared in oceans, endangering sea life. Fish species began dying off due to, over, uh, due to overpredation by humans. Again, this is all fueled by or facilitated by our ability to create technology, which is, I think, an interesting point to bring up uh, or to, to make sure we keep in mind, because basically what has happened is um, technology has allowed for us to be able to amplify our destructive behavior or destructive tendencies. Um, it's amplified or made louder and more destructive our destructive tendencies and our bad or our bad behavior. Indeed, nearly all classes of wild animals declined severely in number, with half of all wildlife having disappeared in the last 40 years. It has been estimated that humans, along with our cattle, pigs, dogs, cats, and other domesticates, now make up over 95% of all terrestrial mammalian uh, mammalian biomass. It is clear that humans' impacts on the biosphere will ultimately be self-limiting. Economic growth and population growth, which have driven those impacts, are subject to ultimate checks, including the depletion of fossil fuels, minerals, soils, and water, as well as the buildup of pollution, including greenhouse gases causing climate change. As I have written elsewhere, it is extremely unlikely that humanity will be able to keep the growth party raging by other means, such as renewable energy or nuclear power. The best we can hope for is an equitable, peaceful, and relatively happy descent from current levels of population and consumption. 
right? So basically, the the, the what he's saying is is that the the, mo the the best we can hope for is instead of getting completely just totally destroyed or um, sort of kicked in the face, um, maybe maybe the kick could be turned into a, a slap. But I, either way, either way, it's um, it's 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 probably gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. It's gonna hurt. It's just how bad. Any population biologist looking at recent trends in human population would conclude that our species is in overshoot, a condition in which a population temporarily exceeds its environment's long-term carrying capacity. In nature, overshoot is always temporary and is followed by die-off. One accounting tool for measuring the degree of our overshoot is the ecological footprint which represents the demand on biocapacity, i.e. area of biologically productive land and water required to produce the ecological services, including resource regeneration and waste absorption for a given population. What you'll often see, um, another term that's often used uh, sort of in, in the academy, so to speak, is um, ecosystem services. So basically as as um, uh, the environment uh, or the, the ecological in, uh, infrastructure, um, as that is diminished in its uh, kind of structural integrity and functional integrity, uh, the, the services that would be made available to those who are living in and among those, those, those places um, you simply don't have those services available to you. So, generally speaking, they're they're, they're under four um, categories. So they're the provisioning services, the regulating services, the um, the supporting services, and what they what are uh, sometimes called the cultural services. So um, that, I'll save that for you know another another time. Where are we? Okay. According to the Global Footprint Network, humanity is currently using over one and a half times Earth's worth of resources annually, though this consumption is not distributed equally. So, for example, it would take four Earth's worth of resources to support U.S. consumption levels. So, if everybody was consuming as much as is consumed in the United States, instead of one and a half times, it would be four times so. This is only possibly oh, this is only possible by drawing down future productive capacity. Important point. In effect, borrowing from future generations. To the extent that we are today eroding the the carrying capacity on which future generations would otherwise depend, our way of life could be characterized as intergenerational predation. So again, another important point. Intergenerational predation. To put it crudely, the old are eating, quote unquote, the young. Here's another way to look at our dilemma. The fossil fuel industrial age represents an unprecedented growth phase in a grand, historic, adaptive cycle. We have seen growth phases before as ancient empires expanded, but such booms always led to periods of, consol of, of, periods of consolidation, the conservation phase, and collapse or release in which population declines and cultural achievements were lost. It could be argued that the last few decades have represented a global conservation phase as the world has enjoyed a period of relative peace and stability with rates of growth in population and GDP or gross domestic product um, beginning to slow. Meanwhile, we are confronted with a paradox on one hand, since there is now more to go around in terms of energy and wealth. So that thing, again, is another interesting point. So there, there is... Um, there's a lot to share. What's yet to be determined is whether or not, even though there is a lot to share, is there a willingness to share? So this this begins to get into a, a discussion that goes beyond simply talking about the, the mechanics or the or the or the functional aspects of 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 what sort of the mechanism um, will permit or, or enable. It's whether or not, even if you have the ability, 
um, is there a willingness to actually use that ability in a particular way? During the 20th century, the domesticated quote unquote classes, i.e. workers in industrial societies gained access to unprecedented benefits, including education, health care, improved housing conditions, cheap and rapid transportation and entertainment. Now, that last point, entertainment, is going to be an, an important um, factor that I think we're going to, we're going to need to, to break down because functionally we have to ask what is, what is the role that entertainment plays in the maintenance of everything that's being talked about here. Life in liberal democracies implies universal access to certain social services, freedom of speech, and social mobility. But on the other hand, the prey classes are often predated upon, quote unquote, in more subtle ways, often having to do with debt. So we, again, this was mentioned in, uh, in the previous episode. Interest bearing debt is nothing new. It has a 5,000 year history. And for millennia, debt and interest have served as tools for the owning classes to predate, quote unquote, upon borrower classes. The rapid growth of energy uh, supplies during the 20th century implied the possibility of a rapid growth in money supplies. Since energy is required for all work, whether done by humans or machines, more available energy meant more work could be done, and thus more money could be generated by work or used to pay for work. So again, this energy relationship, right, either... You have the physical capacity to do the work. And then once you have the physical capacity to do the work, how do you gain access to it? So in this particular instance, that often is going to come in the form of money. Do you have the money or do you have wealth that allows for you to gain access to the, um, to the products or the services that are generated from the work that's done? Now, what's important also to discuss here, and this is, this is talked about a lot, you know, if you, if you, you know, take time to, um, look at the work of, of, um, of economists is that in, in, at present, um, debt is money, right? So one of the reasons why there is a tolerance for debt these days is it's, it still sort of constitutes a type of, um, a type of currency that enables work to be done, that, that, which I think may for many people seem counterintuitive, but um, this is what is, this is the world that we live in. This is what's happening. During the 20th century, the link between money and precious metals, which were inherently limited in quantity, was gradually severed and money was instead linked to debt. The making of a bank loan caused the money into existence. So there's the point made there. Hence, nearly all money is now tied to interest bearing debt with the ever-growing stream of interest flowing to the financial sector. As economist Michael Hudson explains, the financial system has become the primary means of enslavement and plunder in the modern world. I think it, what's interesting is, um, and again, this, this gets into uh, you know, discussion outside of you know, talking about, about the mechanics of the system. This is one of the reasons why you'll find in um, say in, in certain religious traditions, the Abrahamic faiths being, uh, you know, in, in particular, if you look at uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, um, interest or usury, uh, it was was prohibited um, because what it effectively is 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 enslavement. It's it's uh, it's among the worst kinds of the worst varieties of oppression. Um, and again, in Islam, uh, usury, both the, the participation in usury is tantamount to declaring war with, with God. So it's, it's a very um, kind of odious uh, moral infraction. But debt itself eventually becomes a limit to growth. Following the Great Depression of the 1930s, economist Irving Fisher developed the theory of debt deflation which holds that as debt levels rise to the point at which repayment becomes impossible, a moment arrives when large numbers of people default on their loans and mortgages, causing banks to fail and economies to implode. 
uh, in present circumstances, soaring debt levels temporarily mask rising systemic problems that could undermine the wealth generation system supporting modern industrial societies. And we've seen, again, examples of this, the crash of 1929 um, and uh, Black Friday in 1987. Um, and then, you know, most most recently, uh, the, 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 the market crash in uh, 2008. Modern societies run on oil, which powers most ways of transporting food, raw materials, manufactured goods, and people. As high-quality, easily accessed oil deposits deplete, a greater percentage of overall world petroleum supply comes from marginal sources, such as U.S. tight oil, which is produced by hydrofracturing, or what is more popularly known as fracking, and horizontal drilling. However, such production is unprofitable with oil supply uh, with oil prices at pro at affordable levels and the companies specializing in extracting these resources are therefore deeply in debt in effect debt is acting as an energy extender and again this point is um shouldn't be uh can't be underestimated um the fact that it's it's functionally speaking it ex that debt exp uh, extends the ability to do work um, is uh, that's important to understand and appreciate and I think this is one of the reasons why um, when you look at okay what what in fact is uh, what's the impact what are the implications for the willingness to be able to the willingness to to tolerate this kind of thing? So um, one of the one of the stories that came to mind was um, it was a it it was a story that appeared in the in the UK Guardian maybe about a year or two ago um, about the 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 level of uh, uh, or the, the 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 amount of subsidies that are uh, provided to the fossil fuel industry. So here um, again, this is this is from an article dated the seventh of August, uh, two thousand seventeen. Fossil fuel subsidies are a staggering five trillion dollars per year. A new study finds six and a half percent of global GDP goes to subsidizing fossil fuels. So I think it's just interesting that there is a there is a willingness to dedicate. Uh, you know, government funds that are that are um, provided by taxes uh, to this particular industry, as opposed to dedicating those financial resources to something else that might have um, m more broad benefit, kind of distributed to people who don't have access to um, you know the same levels of of um, government largesse. I'll say. Um, there is a willingness, there is, there is a very conscious decision made to give this money to some people and not to others. And, and it seems like the people that these funds or this support is provided to are not necessarily the ones that actually need it the most. Um, they sort of already have access to quite a lot of, um, you know, of, of, of wealth um, and, and resources. But this particular industry, because... It's, it's it everything all of the systems that um have been constructed within sort of the industrial world that we now live in is completely reliant on having access to these fuels so um there is uh basically a, an understanding that if this is allowed to fall apart that the the effect that this has on on other systems that are a part of this sort of industrial world that's that that we now live within, um, all of those things are in jeopardy. Right. So um, again, so we left off at the at the the part here. In effect, debt is acting as an energy extender, enabling the current conservation phase of the grand adaptive cycle to continue, but only until the moment when debt deflation arrives. Right. So eventually, there's going to become a point when all of the debt that's been uh, built up, it, it comes crashing down. And we've already seen how this happens uh, um, uh, periodically. 
other characteristic sy uh, sy symptoms of a societal conservation phase arguably include increasing wealth inequality, a decline in growth of workers' wages, and declining economic prospects for younger generations. Again, the old eating the young. While these, new, uh, while these now appear to be gradual trends, when the release phase arrives, it could do so with a vengeance. And it says uh, here, see the Seneca effect. And you guys can go, all, can go, go ahead and see what the Seneca effect is. Now, um, this, this is the part that I think is of, of particular um, interest here. And this is, this is where I want to really um, get, get into more detail. The world turned upside down. This is five, section five. The world turned upside down. Uh, predators and prey in times of growth and in times of ecological release. However such predation occurs, it must somehow be justified. Must somehow be justified, at least in the minds of predators. If not in those of prey as well. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Religion served this function in many ancient complex societies. The followers of the true faith, quote unquote, having been given divine license to subjugate non-believers, while economic and political ideology do so today with more frequent uh, uh, do so today more frequently. Priests served the kings of ancient civilizations, channeling myths and rituals that valorized the divine right of the monarch. The king claimed ultimate ownership of everything and everybody within the borders of the state, as ordained by the dictates of the sky god. Again, whichever variant of the sky god you want to you want to use, of which he was regarded as an earthly embodiment. Later, as the state became more culturally diverse and more secularized, philosophers and economists served a function similar to that of the ancient priesthood explaining why the rich deserve their riches and the poor their poverty and why everyone owed loyalty to the state, the economic system, or both. One, one ideological system for the justification of predation stands out as particularly influential in the last few hundred years, namely racism. So again, this is very, very interesting that he has really zeroed in on, on this particular uh, on this particular factor, because um, again, if if one could could be as objective as possible uh, in really examining the, the the history of the last you know five hundred years, easily since the you know the uh, yeah probably the last since the sixteenth century, um, the the concept the construct of of racism has loomed large and really shaping everything that we now know of uh in in the you know in the, in the modern world um and 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 the understanding that racism is a it is a construct it is not a it is not an actual reality uh it is not scientific um you know in the in in the the truest sense of the word uh, in that there is no empirical, there's no true, legitimate empirical evidence to give the idea any kind of credence. Right? The circumstances that gave rise to racism centered on the brutal and blatant, and blatant form of predation involving the kidnapping and intergenerational enslavement of Africans by Europeans and European Americans. The practice occurred within wealthy, sophisticated societies that fancied themselves rational, moral, and religious. Thus, it required a new and compelling ideological basis. Now, this is this is where I, I kind of want to just stop for a minute. Now, what he's basically talking about of uh, talking about is uh, the creation of a um, a cosmology, right? So, so there's a so the the so when I say the creation of a cosmology. Um, that that you there's a way that you have to sort of order the universe, or or uh, or the or the one that you think you live in in order to in order for you to be able to justify or make sense of what it is that you're doing. 
So in this particular instance, um, that you have to assign a, a particular value to, uh, in this case, uh, certain groups of people that you want to be able to do certain things to at least to kind of trick yourself into believing that you have a legitimate you have a legitimate basis upon which to do the things that you're doing in order to in, in, in order to sort of put yourself at ease, even though it ultimately doesn't put you at ease. Right. So you kind of have to you have to come up with these very elaborate explanations so that you can basically lie to yourself. And, and also lie to other people, even though eventually this is this is creating a type of um, turbulence that is eventually going to have to be dealt with. And this turbulence ends up sort of manifesting itself in, in a number of different ways. So he, he's um, so we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that point in just a moment. So before the 15th century, the European slave trade centered on East European Slavs, hence the term slave. By the 1400s, the Slavs had improved their self-defenses, and slave traders turned to Africa, Africa for victims. As Portuguese Prince Henry, the navigator, explored the West African coast in the early 15th century, searching for sources of wealth, his, chronicle, his, his chronicler, uh, Gomes Yanes de Zurara, I believe that's how I probably mispronounced that, Gomes Yanes de Zurara, Z-U-R-A-R-A, -R -A, described the burgeoning Portuguese slave trade, categorizing, categorizing Africans as a separate and inferior black race and Europeans as a quote-unquote white and superior race. Previously, white had not existed as a racial category. Now, I'll stop here. Now, the idea that somehow you could take all Europeans and put them under one umbrella is... is um, is preposterous because if anybody knows anything about European history, I mean, th these are people that have been fighting each other for a very long time. So it's not so even if you go to places like the British Isles, it's not like the English saw themselves as the same as the Irish, the Welsh, uh, or the Scots. I mean, I mean, it, it's absurd. So the the so it, even the to the the. the the legitim the the legitimizing this as a as a category that actually has any kind of actual real application from, in, in terms of these are people who can who who can identify um, with having some kind of common experience a way of like seeing the world is it doesn't have any it's not tied to history in, in any way so you have to think that there's another function here. Because there's there's nothing there's nothing that we share. I mean, even in saying that, as a like in terms of phenotype, your physical appearance. Again, this is a this is a gross. I mean, it's a ridiculous oversimplification. I mean, it's just, it's it's as ridiculous as saying again, all black people are um, can all be seen as the same. Again, gross ri oversimplification, ridiculous. Um, I mean, even in terms of uh, phenotype. And sort of genetic identification. I mean, some of the some of the greatest genetic differences between peoples you'll you'll have, for instance, on the African continent between different kinds of black people, right? So the idea that somehow they could all be put under one umbrella is, as a matter of sort of science, or, or empiricism is is um, is absurd. So there there you have to sort of create. Um, a justification which allows for you to be able to even um, entertain this as as a possibility, and again, understanding that well, there must be some other function, right? That it has to serve some other purpose um, aside from uh, aside from it having any kind of uh, legitimacy in terms of kind of the reality that we live in, right? You have to create a reality. You have to reorder the universe to make it fit whatever it is that you are trying to make it okay um is, uh, actually i want to mention a book here uh, actually a few books that 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 actually goes into this um further so aside from talking about you know what what sort of 
black folks have been been talking about this for ages, right? This this these are books that actually um, go into the the identification, the creation of the identification of white as a category. Um, so there's a book there's a book written by a woman named Dr. Janet Batalora called Birth of a White Nation: The Invention of White People and Its Relevance Today. She says as a legal category from from her research, white didn't even exist white quote unquote didn't even exi exist as a legal category until the until the year 1681 so this is late 17th century uh theodore w allen uh he has a book called the invention of the white race volume one racial oppression and social control uh, um, i think that's long been a book that a lot of people have been familiar with uh in particular i think a a, a very interesting study of this idea of sort of whiteness applies specifically to the irish because if anybody knows anything about the history of the irish I mean, it's again that that right there alone is a, is incredible. So um, that's a book um, written by a, a gentleman named Noel Ignatiev, "How the Irish Became White." So, so there, there's some um, there's some other writings, but those are, those are three good places to begin to just again unpack unpack this idea of the creation of categories, um, which uh, allow a certain economic regime again to be put into place so you have again this creation of a cosmology to put into place a particular economic uh, regime and again i think previously i talked about the this book called the empire of things which uh then begins to talk about how uh this whole idea of the human being as consumer and how slave and what and the role that slavery played in the uh in the into the bringing in the bringing to life this conception of 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 people and consumption uh first started and again that that also started in uh i think the, the 1500s 16th century okay so the idea caught on among other europeans who drew on textual textual sources from classical antiquity to sort humans into groups based on physical appearance attributing deeply ingrained behaviors and capacities to those groups. Quickly, the notion arose that people of the allegedly superior quote-unquote white race were not only right in enslaving what amounted cumulatively to several million inferior people of color, quote-unquote, but were doing God's work by bringing civilization to the savages, quote-unquote. An idea, an idea later encapsulated in the title of uh, Rudyard Kipling's poem, uh, The White Man's Burden. In the Southern United States, where slavery became the basis of the agricultural economy, race came to serve as an organizing social principle. Um, now, again, just to go a little further into um, that, again, that particular idea, that, that this concept, uh, I want to just read briefly um, some of what Dr. Batalora had to say about this uh, this development. So again, she she has written um, she's written this book. Uh, the what was it called? Oh, Birth of a White Nation. Again, I don't want to harp on this too too much. I mean, I, I know this is a I mean, this is a really uncomfortable conversation for a lot of people to have because I mean because what it ends up attacking is it, it like examine all examining these things ends up attacking one, one sense of self like you think of yourself as being one thing and then you find out actually it, it's it's something that 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 you're, you're something actually very different um and that's actually quite unsettling so um but I think it's it's it deserves a very very um, close considered examination. It's very important to you know to unpack. I mean, because basically you know you're born into it. You, I mean, we're largely born into a world that is not explained to us very well. Um, I mean, I think that's and it, and there's a there's a reason for that. I mean, it, it, the world as it is constructed works very well for some people and not so well for others. So if it doesn't really serve one's purpose is to explain why things are the way they are, right? Um, then you're not going to go out of your way to volunteer information that doesn't serve you, right? So, um, 
so just read this piece. Is it, this uh, this is uh, from um, actually this is from uh, Jack uh, Jacqueline Battle Doctor Jacqueline Battalora's website, and this was uh, this is from an article that was cited in that was written in the University of uh, for the University of Pittsburgh for a presentation she had given about the work she had done in this. Now, um, Doctor Battalora apparently used to be a a, a cop in Chicago. And um, and then later on went on to become an academic. So I think it's very interesting. It's a very interesting combination, um, you know, in terms of the, the ex her experience, her experience as a cop in Chicago, which, again, I think it's even more, more interesting. Um, and then to see how that has inf how that has informed her scholarship. Uh, yeah, I think it's, you know, it's particularly um, noteworthy. So she says, so again, just to read part of this piece, to, to Jacqueline Battalora, a white, uh, white people are an invention. She clarified, designating, designating a group of light-skinned people as white, quote-unquote, Battalora said, only started less than 350 years ago, and the separation of people by race only dates back to the 17th century. Racial problems, Battalora said, started in the United States after the government passed anti-miscegenation laws which said white people could not marry non-white people. So it's just very interesting to see where, again, this thinking begins, at least in, in, the, uh, in reference to the United States. And again, some of you guys you know, might already be familiar with this, but for those who aren't, this, again, this is, this is very important to understand where these ideas come from. Battalora, a lawyer and professor of sociology and criminal justice at St. Xavier University, made this case to nearly 100 students, faculty, st uh, staff, and community members packed in room uh, 2017 of the Cathedral of Learning at a lecture Wednesday afternoon, yada, 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 yada. Okay, Battalora said her book focuses on the beginning of labeling white people as a distinct group and how the label has caused racial and social problems like segregation and discrimination in the United States. So Battalora also previously served as a, as a Chicago police officer um, Right, and has engaged in anti-racist training since the mid-1990s. So, um, so this was the first time white referenced a group of humanity. And a government doesn't label a group of people for no reason. There is a fundamental piece of information that is desperately... So this is, you know, again, she was saying how this is needed in explaining, um, in, in uh, educating people. So... Um, so Battalore began her lecture by talking about colonial American where, when all free men had the same opportunities as a matter of law. African men could vote, and they did. They could own slaves, and they did. They could marry someone of, of the opposite sex, and they did, Battalore said. Battalore explained the idea of whiteness, quote-unquote, was built off the British idea that you must be Christian and freeborn to deserve rights and privileges that the government can deny others. The idea was not wholly popular at the time, but it eventually led to strict laws. In, 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 seven, in 1676, colonists rebelled as part of Virginia colonist uh, Nathaniel Bacon's rebellion and posed a threat to capitalism. So this is the famous Bacon's Rebellion. After the rebellion, English Parliament issued new laws that included prohibiting blacks from holding office, marrying whites, possessing weapons, and testifying against whites. The government now required that employers pay whites in goods, including uh, gun, uh, in, uh, guns and powder, after completing a term of service. Battalora said these new laws did very little to improve the economic status of these new white people, but it, but it tossed native tribes and people of African descent to the bottom. The laws linked all white people, even those who were common laborers a connection that still occurs today in the context of top 1% and the 99% of income earners. <clears throat> today, many white people feel more connected to Paris Hilton than their African-American neighbors or people of, again, of similar um, economic status. So the first appearance of white, quote unquote, as a label was in 1681, Battalora said, under anti-miscegenation laws, colonial America prohibited marriage between a white person and a non-white person. The, su the Supreme Court ruled these laws unconstitutional in 1967 when it, f when it ruled in favor of interracial marriage in Loving versus Virginia. That's not necessarily particular interest, but the idea is that um, as a legal category and then what 
creating this as a legal category, what it facilitated or what it permitted was essentially you've now got a group who is, um, who can now be made into a permanent, uh, a permanent class of, of, uh, or a permanent group of bonded labor, right? This permanent group of bonded labor is basically your energy, your energy source, which fuels your economy. And again, this has been, this has been broken down pretty thoroughly. So I mentioned in the, in the last episode, um, uh, Edward Baptiste's book, uh, The Half Never Told, about how uh, slavery served as the basis for um, the creation of American capitalism, um, because it was not only a matter of um, this group of bonded labor, labor being, um, being simply an energy source, um, they were also um, a securitized asset. Right, so these were these were things like livestock that could be um, that would be insured, right? That um, you could actually borrow against. They were a way of being able of you being able to get access to other financial capital. And then they then they because they were essentially a product that had to be managed. It also enabled um, uh, other ways to be able to generate economic activity. So obviously somebody had to manage them. Someone had to uh, provide security against them because there was, a, of course, there's a, a major problem with um, slaves um, rebelling um, uh, and 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 pos possibly escaping, and then eventually doing things like destroying property or uh, killing killing their uh, their handlers, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's a very expensive business, um, a very dangerous business. And it was a way for people to be able to establish and create business for themselves, just like having to, dis to, to defend against the native population um, was a way of being able to uh, create business. So this is one of the big reasons why weapons, um, why guns figure uh, so prominently into, um, into th the history of America and the culture of America is that it, it necessitated using a lot of violence to establish these systems. So again, this is just trying to look at this as objectively as possible is functionally speaking, what, what, what does the, the, these, these types of things, uh, what does it facilitate? What is it, what does it permit to happen? So it's not, this is not random. It's not, you know, it's not simply a matter of one group of people not liking another group of people or one group of people just not being nice to another group of people. Functionally, what does this allow? What does this permit? What does this bring into being? So, again, it's very important to, you know, to understand the, the purpose of uh, doing these things. Uh, so, continuing, he says, slavery ended in the U.S. in 1865 due to resi resistance on the part of slaves and ex-slaves. Campaigns of persuasion by abolitionists and a bloody civil war that entailed up to 750,000 deaths. I mean, the, previously, you'll see cited often uh, somewhere on the order of about 100,000 less deaths. But this has, over the years, been, been increased um, to where now, again, the figure is three quarters of a million people dying in the civil war, American civil war. Again, out of a total population of 34 million. So that's a... It's a pretty amazing, um, it's a pretty amazing number. Because so right now, if we look at the the current population in in the United States, which is uh, approximately three hundred and forty million, uh, I've actually you know it's probably close to three hundred thirty million, but it's roughly ten times. Um, that'd be upwards of seven to seven and a half million people dying in the in the American Civil War, the equivalent, the current equivalent. So that's a lot of folks. Very, very destructive. But racism continued and does to this day, not just in the American South, but throughout the nation and internationally as well. And, I, and again, just to, to make sure that we understand that this was not only, um, again, what the war was fought over was not only a, uh, the product of uh, this institution that was practiced in the South. The North was involved in this as well. So again, um, Another book worth worth mentioning again for those who are not again familiar with this history. Uh, there's another book called Complicity: How the North Promoted, Prolonged, and Profited from Slavery by 
Ann Farrow, Joel Lang, Jennifer Frank, and Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham. Um, some other books worth looking up. The American Slave Coast, A History of the Slave Breeding Industry by Ned and Constance uh, Sublet. Uh, then there's Slavery by Another Name, The Reenslavement of Black Americans from the Civil War to World War II by Douglas Blackman. Um, there's some other titles here. But the, you know, the importance of those books is this understanding that, that this was an industry. And I think I'd mentioned in the previous, um, uh, the previous episode that at the, at the start of the Civil War, slaves were, they were the most valuable asset class in the American economy. They were worth more than all of the other asset classes combined, and this has been discussed in a number of different places. Uh, you know, Ta-Nehisi Coates, I think, has also mentioned this point um, in his writings as well. Um, in particular, I think that the article, the long article he wrote for The Atlantic, uh, The Case for Reparations. So it's just under this, so it's it, appreciating this, the 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 the, the economic uh, implications of of all of this, uh, understanding that th that the purpose the purpose of the of the reliance on uh, the the functional import of maintaining this system. Um, Although it, 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 in reading, in reading some accounts, some historical accounts of certain important figures in, in American history, they're having some kind of dis disquietude in, in having this system pr prolonged, be, be prolonged as long as it did. Um, the, the money was talking to them. I mean, when you, even in seeing what happened over here, over in, in, uh, in Britain. So I've been in the, you know, I've been living in the UK for several years. I think what's interesting to see what happened here was uh you know eventually the british had uh outlawed slavery in the in the early 19th century so somewhere between 1800 i think 1804 and 1807 and then eventually in the 1830s uh you know the british ended up um actually paying reparations to british slave owners um as the way in which they would agree to ending slavery so they so there was this understanding that property was sacred to the British. So even for those who wanted to have slavery end, meaning the abolitionists, people like William Wilberforce and all these folks that are celebrated, um, the, only, the only way for it to end sort of formally as an institution would be, what, would be if the people who were profiting from it would be repaid for what they were going to lose from its being abolished. So you, you can see this, there's a, there's a British historian named David Olusuga who, who talks about this, there's a great BBC documentary where he, where he goes through this history. Um, British slave owners were paid the equivalent of 40% of the entire British, what was contained in the entire British treasury in the, in the year 1834, um, which was in those days, it was 20 million British pounds, which in our time would be equal to roughly 30 billion US dollars or about 17 billion British pounds. Um, and again, the people who were enslaved received nothing. Because, and, the only, and, the, and what you can only conclude is that the reason why they received nothing, nothing is because they were not people. So again, how do, how do you reconcile that in your mind? Cosmology, you have to, you have to create a some kind of cosmological um, uh, ordering, which permits you, which allows for you to be able to do those kinds of things, to where what it is that you're doing ultimately is not of consequence, you know, really much consequence because you're not dealing with people, right? That's 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 the way you, you reconcile it. That's the way they reconcile it. Basically. Okay. Back to the piece. So he, so he continues here, but racism continue and does to this and, and does to this day, not just in the American South, but throughout the nation and internationally as well. For the white for the white upper classes, it ensures the solidarity of much of the white working class with elites, rather than the people of color of similar economic status. And this is again, this is one of the like really pernicious elements 
uh, or aspects of, of racism is that and is that because you've made people who don't look like you into non-humans and the reason why you've made them into non-humans is because they don't look like you uh, which is a very strange kind of um it's a really weird like narcissism that somehow unless someone looks like you unless they reflect you um they can't be human it's very weird even though you're both in the same boat right you're, in, you're both in the same situation and the same people who are exploiting that have exploited them are also exploiting you. But somehow you you are convinced that the people who are exploiting you are the same as you because they they resemble you. So it's, again, it's a very strange kind of you know, sort of Jedi mind tricks type of uh, type of you know type of arrangement. It's very very odd. So, okay, so meanwhile, the poor of all ethnicities, including poor European Americans, remain subject to a predatory economic system. From the, from the praise point of view, predation looks and feels like persistent poverty, lack of opportunity, cultural oppression, and much higher rates of incarceration and police violence. The lower class person is encouraged to think, if I'm not getting ahead, it's my fault, or it's the fault of other groups who are competing unfairly for scarce resources. <laughs> right, so again, this is another one of those, um, you know, ways of being able to take advantage of people psychologically is um again the the situation is said to be the fault not of the not of the the exploiter not of the one who has sort of created this system which allows for them to exploit or predate on uh on you know on on people on uh, on other groups of people um you make it the fault of the of the exploited right that's a cosmological thing Right? You have to, you have to construct the world in a manner that allows for you to be able to reconcile to justify doing doing these things to people. From the elite's point of view, predation looks quite different. The upper classes are encouraged to think we deserve all that we have because we are superior. We're smarter. We work harder, and we are the result of good breeding. The prey, in contrast, are often conceived conceived of by elites as unintelligent, lazy, and lacking in breeding. They are to be managed like cattle or sheep for their own good via low-wage jobs, drugs, debt, and prisons. Often elites turn reality on its head, painting the poor as parasites. Which is, again, a very... <laughs> it's, it's a really neat trick. That the, you know, that the, the, the people who are... The people who are siphoning siphoning off of li or living off of the labor of other people that those that the people who are doing the work that are being that are being extracted are the parasites again it's a very neat neat bit of uh you know psychological warfare if you will right often elites turn reality on its head painting the poor as parasites and themselves as the producers of all that is worthy in society the ideology of the elites is inculcated in each new generation in exclusive schools and reinforced through high-class, quote-unquote, amusements, including memberships in country clubs and symbols of achievement. The upper and lower classes alike tend to share the view that it is better to be a predator. However, such prey, uh, or however, such predator-prey relationships are not stable over long periods of time. As we have seen, human society is subject to environmental carrying capacity limits, population cycles, and debt cycles analogous to the adaptive cycle in ecosystems. Uh, during the during the growth phase of such cycles, society as a whole tends to become less complex. Predators and prey may be uh, may all benefit, though to differing degrees. But during the release phase, revolution, civil war, invasion, invasion, and collapse may ensue. The system of domestication partially breaks down to the detriment of both predators and prey. And we can certainly see this um, if you go back to again the early days of industrialization. Um, you go to the late 19th, early 20th centuries. I mean, um, there's a great documentary um, which, which talks about this multi-part documentary called uh, Plutocracy. I, I think the name of the, uh, the production company is Metanoia Films, if I remember correctly. But basically, it goes into this whole history of this, you know, this violent tug of war between, uh, between labor and capital and how 
really the way that they finally were able to get this sorted out was after after labor ends up implementing what came to be known as this whole uh, campaign of uh, propaganda propaganda of the deed, which was basically terrorism, uh, which would now be called terrorism. But um, this is this is more or less what eventually convinced capital, right? Which com which conv convinced you know folks who would be, be in the classes of the robber barons and the financiers and the industrialists that it was in their best interest to sort of give a little ground, right? To concede uh, a little ground in order to get people to to chill out a bit, um, to sort of placate them. And I think this gets back into um, the way that the strategies that are implemented to kind of maintain things, uh, it changes. You know, folks get a, they get a little smarter. They realize that, again, there's an enlightened self-interest and maybe given, you know, given, given a bit more away than they, than they have in the past, not to be too greedy, um, although they're still too greedy, uh, that what is the threshold uh, what is the threshold for things to eventually sort of turn bad for them or, or to become difficult? Um, because if anything, a lot of the, you know, the previous, um, you know, inequalities of the, of the past have just become that much more, um, that much more amplified. Uh, if, if anything has changed, the, the ability to, to provide more ways of distracting people and taking taking one's attention away from the fact that things are more unequal than they've been in the past. That's what that's what has has gotten. Um, uh, that's what that's that's one of the things that has really changed in a in a significant way is that you have access to more distraction. So again, all of the sort of sort of dystopian. Um, uh, visions that were expressed by, you know, a lot of the dystopian writers like, again, uh, Huxley and, and, um, and Orwell and, you know, all of these people, um, I mean, it, it kind of in hindsight, they sort of underwrote it. You know, they, they definitely pointed folks in the direction, but you know, what you come, what you come to see now is that, um, it's actually a, a much more advanced than you know than what they had written but they definitely had their finger on the pulse of where things were were, were eventually going to get to so um he continues and it's almost done here however such predator per, such predator prey relationships are not stable over long periods of time as we have seen human society is subject to environmental carrying capacity limits population cycles and debt cycles analogous to the adaptive cycle in ecosystems during the growth phase of such cycles, society as a whole tends to become more complex. Predators and prey may all benefit, though to differing degrees. But during the release phase, revolution, civil war, invasion, and collapse may ensue. The, the system of domestication partially breaks down to the detriment of both predators and prey. So I, I've already read that. For, predator, for prey classes, which are already living with little or no surplus or cushion against hard times... Collapse brings immediate and severe hardship. Nevertheless, prey may have opportunity to escape from, from dreary routines as the mechanisms for the maintenance of the means of predation, including the financial system, fail. There is the opportunity to form cooperative efforts to meet basic needs directly rather than via elite managed systems of production and distribution. Predator classes are initially at least somewhat insulated from hard times, as the release phase of the cycle approaches. After all, they have plenty of surplus, including money and means of mobility, hence the current elite craze for building bunkers in New Zealand. And there have actually been some really interesting pieces written about that. But wealth held in stocks, bonds, and derivatives can disappear virtually overnight during times of financial crisis. Under such circumstances, elites can find themselves in mortal competition, not just with angry mobs or former prey, but with other elites as well. In effect, the human ecosystem in times of ecological release finds itself plagued with an overabundance of predators. During times of growth and conservation, elites maintain gatekeeping mechanisms and forms of 
intra-elite competition to ensure that the predatory class does not become overpopulated in relation to available prey. As the release, fra as the, as the release phase approaches, an overproduction of elites, to use Peter Turchin's phase, uh, phrase, leads to much fiercer, much fiercer intra-elite competition, which can take the forms of coups and revolutionary movements. So this leads us to the, to the consideration of still more biological metaphors, and this is what comes up in the other part. But again, there's a lot, there's a lot covered here, and there's, there's certainly more that um, I, I, I want to um, unpack here, and especially the, the, the predator-prey relationship that he, um, the example that he provides in talking about the role that racism has, uh, yeah, the role that, that racism has played, again, in sort of the current um, incarnation or the, the current uh, iteration of, of this predator-prey relationship in, in, in society and how that's played out. Um, and in particular, I want to look at uh, a, a book that uh, is actually not widely available um, called Who Needs the Negro by uh, Sidney M. Wilhelm, uh, who was a, he was a sociologist, uh, and uh, I'm sorry, an associate professor of sociology at uh, the State University of New York at Buffalo. Uh, which I, I could have gone to it, uh, you know, years ago. I had a, a, a scholarship offer from there, but had I known he was there and had I known about him, you know, 25 years ago, I, I think I might have reconsidered where I went to school. But um, and his this book is brilliant, brilliant book, um, and I'm not surprised that it's very difficult to get a hold of because I think he did a bit too much truth telling in that book. So uh, so I, I'm going to sign off now. Um, again, I, I, hopefully folks will, are, are finding at least some of this stuff interesting, um, and somewhat useful. Um, and, uh, I'd like to think, uh, again, there'll, there'll be more of a discussion about, you know, what, what we're talking, what we're, what we're examining here. And, um, yeah, until next time, these days, the hinterlands are global. So get away right away. <laughs>